Have you ever noticed, maybe lately, how at Christmas time things are supposed to be different, better? What I mean by that is people are to be more loving. We're supposed to be more giving at Christmas time. We're supposed to be more forgiving, more helpful, more thoughtful. It's the time of the year when there's supposed to be a greater focus upon family togetherness. A time of the year when when the music seems to focus more upon the praises of God and for His abundant grace. As a matter of fact, several programs that my wife and I have had the privilege to watch over the last few weeks have used a constant phrase which I thought was interesting. They call it the, it's the miracle of Christmas. My question this morning, though, is why is it that these attitudes and these actions, if you will, seem to be reserved for Christmas? Why is it that they are emphasized only at this time of the year, or so it seems? It's true that the birth of Jesus introduced the coming of God into this world in human form. And it is also true that an angel announced the birth to the shepherds who were tending their flocks in the fields outside Bethlehem and said or described him as a Savior who is Christ the Lord. It's also true that after that shepherd finished that announcement to those shepherds, He was joined by heavenly host, a number of angels who were also praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among men with whom he is pleased. It's also true that those shepherds, after going to see the child, returned back to their fields to tend their sheep, glorifying and praising God for all they had seen and heard. Those things are all true. And I believe that we should rejoice. We should rejoice that our Lord came to live among us as a man because had he not done so, you and I would never have known the great love which God has for us, a love that was so great that he sent his only begotten son into this world to redeem us back to himself. You and I would not have been privileged to read and see how God acted in the human situation as he lived among men. You and I would not have experienced the great sacrifice that was paid for our sins on the cross of Calvary so long ago to redeem us back to our Heavenly Father. And I know that a good portion of the world recognizes December the 25th as the date to commemorate and celebrate the coming of our Savior into the world, even though the evidence suggests that this was not the time of the year that it actually took place. As a matter of fact, it was in the second century that this began to be utilized, and it was more as a way of overriding, if you will, a pagan feast that was celebrated by the Romans at the time. But I know this. The first few generations of Christians, while they did not celebrate his birth, they celebrated his death, his burial, and his resurrection, which is what we will do here in just a moment with our partaking of the Lord's Supper. Because they understood that to be the message of the gospel. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, there in verses 3 and 4, what we find Paul saying as he writes to these Christians is that I deliver to you for a, to li- deliver to you as of first importance that what I also received. What is it? That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures that he was buried, and that he was raised again on the third day, or raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Now say all of that, because I believe that those of us in this room this morning and those who will watch this later have a very important mission that lay before us. And that mission is for us not only to share the good news of God's amazing grace that's been extended to us through His Son, but it is also to spend the rest of the year that is coming and the rest of our lives showing the world around us that there are some very important truths 
and some very important attitudes that are to be lived out not just one month out of the year and not just celebrated on one day of the year, but through the rest of the year as well. Folks, every day of our lives as Christians, we must work at loving others more. Not just today and tomorrow, not just in the month of December, not just in the, the weeks from Thanksgiving up through Christmas, but every day of our lives. Jesus said that it's easy to love those who love you. That's what was just read for us a moment ago by Hunter. There in verse 32 of Luke chapter 6, if you love those who love you, he said, what credit is to you? For even sinners love those who love them. It's easy to love people who love you. But Jesus said, I want you to love your enemies. I want you to love those who aren't so easy to love, those who don't like you, maybe even those who, who hate you. And this is one of the steps he pointed out to us becoming sons of the Most High, is that we are people who love. The Apostle John emphasized this because over in 1 John chapter 4, there in verse 7, he said, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God or from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. And then he said, The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. We know God, at least we should. And if we know God, then one of the things that John says is that we are to love one another. Why? Because God is love. And God loves us. He loved us enough to send His own Son. But what does that love look like when you put it in our shoes? When you put human skin on it? When you begin to live it out every day of your lives? It's not the infatuation that we think of or what you used to think of when we were young and when we were find somebody that, oh, I'm in love. There's more to it. And those of you that have lived a few years upon this earth, you know that. Paul puts some human skin, if you will, on that concept over in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If you begin there in verse 4, he tells us that this love that God wants us to have for one another is a love that is patient. It's a love that is kind. He said it is a love that does not envy or boast. It's a love that is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way he said it's not irritable it's not a resentful love no it's a love that doesn't rejoice in wrongdoing instead it rejoices in truth and then he he added these fourfold things he said it is a love that bears all things believes all things hopes all things and endures all things now i don't know about you i have a hard time trying to live up to that concept of love because i'm human I'm going to admit there are times I get irritable. There are times that I'm not as kind as I ought to be. There are times that I am not as patient as I need to be. But that's what it means to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's what it means to grow in our lives as Christians is that we learn how to love more each day. And so one of the things that I want to encourage every one of you to do over this next year is to love somebody a little bit more. Be a little more patient with your husband or your wife or your children. Be kind to somebody at work that maybe is not so kind to you. Be a person. person that knows how to bear things that sometimes are just a little tough in life how to believe what's best about somebody else be that type of person and I think I've lost that mic and gone to this one be a person that does those things somebody that hopes all that is good for someone else and someone that endures even when it seems like you don't know if you can keep pressing on because God will help you to do that but let's show the world that that's what a Christian does, not just for 25 days in a month out of the year, but what a person does year-round as a child of God. Not only that, I want to encourage you 
to do this. Every day of our lives must be a day that we demonstrate a life of giving and forgiving. Do you realize that you have a God who is a giving God? He gives in more ways than we can count. We often talk about count your blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Yes, that is true. But Jesus said to Nicodemus in that nighttime meeting that God so loved the world that he did what? He gave his only begotten son for us to redeem us, to save us. And over in Mark chapter 10, verse 45, on another occasion, he said that the Son of Man came to do what? He said he came to give his life as a ransom for many. He came for this purpose, to give of himself for our salvation. Jesus even invites all of us who are weary and heavy laden to come unto him. And he says, and I will give you rest. We pray. That each day God will give us our daily bread, do we not? But the question is, what do we give? What do we give? First of all, what do we give to God? Do we give to God our hearts? Do we give Him our minds and say, fill them with your will and your word? Do, do we give Him our strength and say, use me? as you would have me to be used? Do we give him our time, our ability, and yes, even our money? There's a hymn that we sometimes sing. It's called Take My Life and Let It Be. It was actually written back in 1874. But I want to share with you the words, some of the words to this hymn, because it is a prayer that is being prayed to God as we sing. And in it we say, Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. In the second stanza, we sing, Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let me sing always only for my king. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from thee. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I behold. Take my intellect and use every power as thou shalt choose. Take my will and make it thine. It shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own. It shall be thy royal throne. Take my love, Lord, my Lord, I pour at thy feet its treasure store. Take myself and I will be ever only all for thee. Next time you sing that hymn, think about what you're asking God to do. God, use me. Let me give back to you in those ways. How do we give to others? You know what is emphasized most at this time of the year are our physical gifts. And, and in a way that's good, but in a way that's also sad because you ever seen a young person that opens a gift and just has that dour look upon his face or her face like, that's not what I wanted. I wanted this, but you gave me that. I don't like that. I don't want that gift. But the gift, the gifts that keep on giving are gifts of time spent in the life of another. Our gift of a listening ear when somebody just needs to share with us something that's going on in their life and they want our advice on it. A, a, a gift that we often need is a word of encouragement. Somebody that says to us, I believe in you. I'm in here for you. I want you to know that I'm going to stand by you through all of this, regardless of what may come. What about a gift of a hug or something else that is needed for the moment? Young people, I want to encourage you to give some gifts to your parents this year. You may say, well, I don't have any money. You don't need money. Give your mom or your dad a hug. Help them wash up the dishes after breakfast tomorrow morning. Help them pick up all the wrapping paper after everybody's ripped it off the presents and thrown it on the floor. Make your room for a month. Help them clean the house. There are so many gifts you can give that don't cost a dime except for your time and your energy. Give. 
That's what God does, is He gives. But also forgive. You know, God has forgiven us. He's forgiven us our sins. He's forgiven us our trespasses, our transgressions. Anybody here this morning that is a Christian, you have experienced this forgiveness and the pouring out of the blood of Christ upon your soul to wash you of your sins, to give you an eternal life, an abundant life with Him. But the question is, what about you and your forgiving? How well are we at forgiving somebody? Are we still holding grudges that we've had for years? We need to let go of them. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, one of the things that we find Paul saying is be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, even as God in Christ also has forgiven you. He forgave us. The least we can do is forgive someone else for a trespass against us. But another thing I want to encourage each of us to do, not just this time of the year, but the rest of our lives, every day, every day, will you seek to be more helpful and more thoughtful toward those around you? In the passage that was read for us a moment ago, Hunter shared with us, if you'll notice, verse 35, something Jesus said. He said, do good. Do good. If you look at a statement that Peter makes about Jesus in Acts chapter 10, there in verse 38, as he is speaking to the household of Cornelius, he says that Jesus was one who went about doing good. None of us have the ability to do the miraculous things that Jesus did. We can't raise the dead. We can't cause the lame to walk or the blind to see or the deaf to hear or the dumb to speak. We can't do all of those things, but we can do some other things. We can do good for those who are around us. We can be thoughtful toward those that we encounter. We can cook a meal and take it to a bereaved family who has lost a loved one or to somebody that just recently returned home from the hospital and shouldn't be doing those, ty those types of tasks. We can take someone to a doctor's appointment, can't we adults? We can pick up the groceries that someone may need but can't go get themselves. Maybe we can pick up a prescription for them. We can visit a shut-in or maybe a member who has been away for some time or, or a, another individual that just needs our encouragement. We can babysit for a young mother who's, who's kind of had her fill for a while and needs just a break for a little bit, just to have some adult conversation or maybe even babysit so that a young couple can go out and spend an evening together, something that perhaps they haven't been able to do in a while. We can help an older member with a task around their house, young people. It may be cleaning gutters or raking leaves, or it may be simply picking up things inside the house that they can't reach, pulling something down from a tall shelf or getting something from down low. But there are so many ways in which we can be helpful and thoughtful. You know, Paul wrote in Romans chapter 14, verse 19, that we are to pursue the things which make for peace in the building up of one another. Being helpful and thoughtful means that we go around trying to think about how can I build somebody else up? How can I encourage them? In Galatians 5 verse 13, he encourages us to serve one another. In Galatians chapter 6 verse 2, he says, Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. In doing those things, doing for others, we are being helpful. We are being thoughtful. Young people, you can be helpful. Help your mom in the kitchen. Help your dad out in the yard. Do things that let them know that you appreciate them so that they feel like you've been thoughtful of them. And not just this time of the year, but throughout the year. Because what we're doing is we're showing the world that living a Christian life is not relegated to just a few special days but it is something that we do year round every day as long as God gives us breath upon this earth and then lastly I want to encourage you that as we live among our our, our community and the, our friends and our neighbors 
let us do something else. Let it be evident that we are a people who every day praise our God for His grace, His mercy, and His love. I've heard people say, I get so tired of hearing Christmas music. It seems like that's all that plays on the radio these days. But you know, I don't get tired of praising God. And I hope you don't either. If you read in the New Testament, you find that both Paul and Peter were quick to praise God. As a matter of fact, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, one of the things that Paul says there is, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, or Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And then when you come over to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, Peter says almost the same thing. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and then he says this, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Go to the book of Revelation. I love what John is permitted to see and what he shares with us. If you go to Revelation chapter 5 verse 13, you find there this heavenly host who is praising both Father and Son. And what John records them as saying there is, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And then when you come to chapter 7, and John is permitted to see this, this host that no one can number from every nation and tribe and what they're singing is it's a great multitude he says no one can count and they're crying out with a loud voice and what they're saying is salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb and then what you find just a, a few verses later is that suddenly this multitude is joined by all the angels and the elders and the 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 beast that are excuse me the 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 creatures that are mentioned there and it says that they fall on their faces before the throne and worship God saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. You ever heard the Hallelujah Chorus? Seems like it's only played this time of the year. But folks, it is... It is a beautiful peace that does nothing but praise God. And the word hallelujah means praise Jehovah or praise Yahweh. That's what it means. There's an old hymn that we have sung here time and again. I grew up learning this hymn when I was just a, a boy in a congregation not far from here. You know it simply by the words that it the tune or the, the name of the words at the beginning. Hallelujah, praise Jehovah. I remember it in old Christian hymns 3. I think it was 143 or somewhere like that. But let me share with you the words from that hymn. It was written in 1899 by William Kirkpatrick. And here's what it says. It's taken, if you will, from Psalm 148. Straight from the psalm. Hallelujah, praise Jehovah. From the heavens, praise His name. Praise Jehovah in the highest. All his angels praise, proclaim. All his hosts together praise him. Sun and moon and stars on high. Praise him, O ye heaven of heavens and ye floods above the sky. Let them praise us, give Jehovah. They were made at his command. Them forever he established. His decree shall ever stand. From the earth, O praise Jehovah. All ye floods, ye dragons all. Fire and hail and snow and vapor. Stormy winds that hear his call. All ye fruitful trees and cedars, all ye hills and mountains high, creeping things and beasts and cattle, birds that in the heavens fly, kings of earth and all ye people, princes, great earth's judges all, praise his name, young men and maidens, aged men and children small. Let them praises give Jehovah, for his name alone is high, and his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted. And his glory is exalted far above the earth and sky. Our praise for God should not be emphasized only for a month. We should be people who are praising him all the days of our lives. I, I can remember years ago when I was in college, there was a preacher that many of you will recognize his name, Thomas Holland. We call him Tom Holland. I'd see him walking across campus. You know what he was doing? 
singing. He'd walk into his office. You know what he'd be doing? Singing. Because he loved to do that. And it was always a song of praise. Our God is great and he's worthy of our praise. Folks, let us do it every day in our lives, not just when we're gathered together, but out in the community. Let people know who it is we serve. What I'm trying to say with all of this is it, that it isn't only at this time of the year alone that we should be more loving and more giving and more forgiving and more helpful and more thoughtful and kind, nor is it only at this time of the year that our praise and our adoration for our God and our Savior needs to be more pronounced than in any other time of the year. Our God intends for these actions to be a part of our lives every day that we live upon the face of this planet. And my prayer is that those who know us, the people that we encounter, will come to know us as a people who are more kind, who are more loving, who are more thoughtful and helpful, who are more giving and forgiving, who are more praising of our God. If you're here this morning and you've not been saved by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, I want you to experience the greatest gift that has ever been given upon the face of this planet. The gift of salvation to you so that your sins might be washed away and that you might have that promise of an eternal abode in heaven above with our God where he is waiting for us, longing for the day when he will send his son to bring us home. But if you're a child of God here to this day and you haven't been as loving as you should be, you haven't been as forgiving, you haven't been as thoughtful and kind, why not today make the decision, I'm going to change that. I'm going to be more of the person that God wants me to be. I'm going to live for Him. I'm going to honor Him. If we need to pray with you or for you, we're more than willing to do that. If you need to respond in order that your sins might be, forgiven then know this softly and tenderly jesus is calling calling you to come home and we invite you to do just that as together we stand and sing